Brothers and sisters, aloha. Elder Welch and I are thrilled to be here serving as missionaries, team teaching in the Book of Mormon classes. Although we do miss our four children and our 17 grandchildren, our students have already touched our hearts with their testimonies and faith practices. It is such a joy for us to deepen our understanding of the scriptures together as we teach them. We have been delighted to be reminded how much we love to teach. Since it's been several years since I retired from the BYU French department, and for Elder Welch, reading or teaching about the Book of Mormon is a lifetime passion. As you've already heard, many people know of John W. Welch because of his discovery of chiasmus in the Book of Mormon as a missionary in Germany more than 50 years ago. Chiasmus, for those of you who don't know, is the literary technique of saying things in one order and then repeating them in the opposite order, a technique used almost uniquely by biblical writers. The discovery that chiasmus also appears in the Book of Mormon resulted for him in years of scholarship relating to the Bible and the Book of Mormon that has recently culminated in heading up the creation of a website called bookofmormoncentral.org, which currently reaches over a million people per week. Over the years, Elder Welch has written many articles, books, some academic, and others for more popular audiences. He served in a variety of really interesting assignments, including editor of BYU Studies and the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, and all of this in addition to being on the faculty of the BYU Law School for 40 years. His preparation included studies at Oxford and Duke University. We met at BYU Provo in the library, of course. Where else would you find a guy like this? Elder Welch and I have had, yes, many interesting conversations, and we have combined our interests in art, literature, history, and travel, and have been able to visit so many wonderful places in the world. We have found that teamwork enhances both of us, and it permits greater achievement than going it alone. Our family motto is, we're better together forever. When I was the director of a study abroad semester to France, I was so grateful for his invaluable help with many aspects of my program. And then it was in France, helping me, that he became intrigued with the allegorical interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, present in stained glass windows of the Chartres Cathedral. And that led to lengthy studies, return trips to France, which was just fine with me, and eventually, articles in the Ensign, BYU Studies, and finally in a book that we wrote together on seeing how the parables of Jesus reveal the plan of salvation. Whenever we travel, the teachings of the Book of Mormon are never far from our mind. So we were really intrigued when we first visited and saw the, the Christus statue in Denmark and when we realized that it was originally commissioned in 1820. How very interesting to know that even as Christ was preparing Joseph Smith for the Book of Mormon translation, he was also inspiring an artist to create a new and even revolutionary image of him, so that instead of the painful depiction of his death on the cross at Calvary, which is seen above the altar, either that or just the cross itself, in most Western churches, the worshipers in Copenhagen, Denmark, could contemplate instead the radiant and glorious risen Redeemer, exactly as seen by those faithful Nephite believers at the temple in Bountiful. The Savior here has outstretched and inviting arms and with visible marks of his atoning sacrifice that remind all of us that he has paid the penalty for us. And as we take his name upon us, 
we can become clean and welcome in His and the Father's presence. At the base of the original statue, we saw how the artist had conveyed power and movement as the foot of the Savior is stepping purposefully toward the viewer, accompanied by the inviting words, Come unto me, which we could understand with the help of the scripture notation. But then, when we read and understood the words above the Christus, who stands encircled by what seems to be a column of golden light, we knew this artistic inspiration was no chance coincidence of timing. God is truly in the details of his work. For the Danish words from Mark 9, 7 say, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. This stunning portrayal of the true and living Christ was finished in 1829, just as his words in the Book of Mormon were being readied for publication. Is it any wonder that Danes responded in droves to the message of the missionaries and that the Book of Mormon was first translated into Danish? And now, all members everywhere have been blessed by our Church's reproduction of this beautiful statue, which can be seen in visitor centers all over the world and has recently been adopted as the official logo of the Church. As we stand beneath this beautiful statue, we are able to imagine that we, too, can be a part of that amazing event at the Temple in Bountiful and contemplate our own coming encounter on the other side of the veil with Jesus Christ himself. The Book of Mormon promises that those who read its pages will find peace and healing. And I'd like to end by sharing the story of someone who found exactly that. This message came to me as a result of my first missionary experience just five weeks ago in the MTC when, as directed by my trainer, I was able to post a missionary message on Facebook. Within hours, to my great surprise, I received this reply from a student from a high school French class more than 35 years ago. He said, I was just thinking of you, and here you popped up on Facebook. I want you to know I've been sober. For, I want you to know I've been sober for 30 years and have been married in the temple. Well, of course, I messaged him back. And with his permission, here is his story. After years of drug and alcohol abuse, he hit bottom. His parents put him in rehab and he was able to stay sober, but mentally and emotionally, he struggled even more. He was deeply paranoid and diagnosed with schizophrenia and sure he had acquired AIDS from a tattoo needle and that the police were coming for him for some unknown crime, so he insisted on sleeping in his neighbor's yard. In desperation to grab hold of any truth, he read many religious books, including the Koran. He then decided to become a Buddhist and found that nothing brought him peace. And then one day his girlfriend said to him, why don't you try the Book of Mormon? I will share his words for what happened next. I was resistant, but then what did I have to lose? So I got a book and I started reading. I just got small tastes of something, something real, something I couldn't explain, something I hadn't felt before. Don't get me wrong, my life was still in shambles, but something kept urging me, and I had to follow. It wasn't a particular verse or, or a story, but I started to come alive. I'm convinced it was my dedication that showed God I was serious by literally never letting the book leave my side. My life got better, although I was not officially happy, so to speak, until even years later. The Book of Mormon gave me my life back. I'm not worried about AIDS or the police in many years. Something about that book made me feel safe. Today, I still try to read every day, and what I have found, it opens a literal portal 
to the spirit world, and it makes the impossible happen. I still have a lot of struggles, and I'm learning to live by faith. But if I was with your students in Hawaii, I would tell them this book is about safety, safety in the spiritual sense as well as the physical. Tell your students modern life is about spiritual war, and this book is a literal shield. Life can be terrifying, but we have help. Thanks for listening. I'm honored you would want to share my story. Brothers and sisters, in the Book of Mormon, we have messages of truth sent to us from God, which are essential to our mortal and our eternal salvation. When you go home today, will you take time to find and pick up a physical copy of the Book of Mormon, a sign, this sign to you personally from God? And you ask Alma's question, and it was the same one my student said, is this not real? Is this not real? And as you do so, envision that moment that you and I, all of us, will have as we come face to face with Moroni, and we will look him in the eye, and the Lord will say to you and I, did I not declare my words unto you? I testify to you that this book is real. It contains the words of God to us, and it can powerfully bless us in ways we can't even imagine. And I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Welch, musicians, and all of you for being here today. Sister Welch and I are very glad to be teaching here together among all of you. We've come to love the students, colleagues, and administrators in this holy place of refuge. It is a joy to be a part of this great hukilau, with all pulling together on gospel chords that stretch out worldwide gather us into the welcoming arms of Jesus, and bind us together eternally. Brothers and sisters, we testify that God cares about this world and about your place in it. He is in the details, as Sister Welch has said, as well as in the big plan of eternal life. As an embodied God, he is in your space and time. He regards and guards the seasons of our individual and collective lives. We all recognize the importance of being in the right place at the right time, and sometimes we even say timing is everything. And timing is indeed important to God as He makes His appearances among us, His children. For example, it was no accident that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was crucified the day before Passover when Paschal lambs were being sacrificed all around Jerusalem. Jesus did not control the precise timing or the exact manner of His execution. Yet somehow, in God's providence, Jesus' death worked out when and how the prophets had said it would. Likewise, it was no accident that Elijah appeared in the Kirtland Temple on April 3, 1836. That day also happened to be right during the Passover season that year. On that Jewish holiday, families gathered and an empty place was set for Elijah for his foretold coming, which resorted, restored the power to bind families together forever. So let's have a little fun with this idea. Just last week on September, well, what was it, the 17th or 18th? I'm, I'm sorry. Just last week on September 21st, my colleagues and I at Book of Mormon Central enjoyed celebrating what we call Moroni Day. On that important date in 1823, Moroni appeared four times in those early morning hours to Joseph Smith. 
So when I was asked a couple of weeks ago to speak to you today, my first impression was, well, it's Moroni season. What a good time to talk about Moroni and his day. So today I ask, if we were to commemorate Moroni Day, what might that celebration look like? What can we learn from Moroni and celebrate with him? Well, for starters, September 21st would be a great day to celebrate the transition of young people from youth into adulthood. On that day in 1823, Joseph Smith was still only 17 years and nine months old. During Moroni's first visit, he quoted the prophecy in Joel 2.28 that in the day of fulfillment young men shall see visions. And Joel's next verse continues, And upon the young women I will pour out my spirit. Surely Joseph and Emma Smith, as well as many of the youthful converts who have flocked to the restored Church then and now, have fulfilled that biblical prophecy. Three months later, Joseph would pass into today's age of adulthood, ready to maturely assume its privileges and responsibilities, as many of you have recently done. As the string of annual Moroni days continued for the next four September 21sts, Joseph was blessed with a stewardship interview each time with Moroni, as our Prophet and President Nelson has recently called these visits of which Joseph kept his parents informed. So our celebration of Moroni Day could also be a time for us to check in with our ecclesiastical leaders and to confer with parents or advisors to plan and learn more about what we hope to accomplish in the next 12 months. By the fifth and final Moroni Day, four years later, Joseph and Emma had gotten married and Joseph was awarded, as we might say, with a four-year four degree qualifying him for the work, having majored, let's say, in divine scripture with three minors in ancient history, heavenly communications, and adversarial strategies. Moreover, and I find this very interesting, in the 1820s, September 21st often fell within the most holy season of the Jewish calendar a sacred time which began on the first day of the Jewish lunar month of Tishri. That time usually falls around the middle of our month September. You see, in addition to commanding people to keep each weekly Sabbath day holy, the Law of Moses required the observance of certain annual holy days as well. Those specific days were super Sabbaths. They were especially important to God. And as Moroni knew, many distinctive Hebraic forms of speech, such as chiasmus, as Sister Welch has mentioned, he also would have understood the calendrical demands of ancient Israelite law. Such things were fundamental to Nephite civilization. King Benjamin, for example, delivered his speech while his people dwelt in tents facing the temple, which indicates that they were observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Thus, it would not seem accidental that Moroni came each of his five times to Joseph Smith during the high, holy Israelite season. As has been published in Book of Mormon Central's Know Why Number 193, Moroni's first visit on September 21, 1823, came precisely on the day on which the Feast of Tabernacles was being observed throughout the world that year. On that day, Israelites joyously remembered their dwelling as families in tents when they were delivered from Egypt and protected by the Lord. It was also the preferred day when Israelite kings were crowned, the heavenly king was praised, and the law of Moses was publicly read and instructions were given. What a great day for Moroni's opening instructions to train Joseph Smith. And then, in 1824 and 1827, the second and fifth Moroni days on September 21st on our calendar, coincided both of those days and years with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year's Day, the first day of Tishri. That Jewish holy day celebrated the renewal of God's creation. Righteous judgments and admonitions were given. 
covenants were renewed, and new beginnings were launched. Sounds like things Moroni loved. And most holy of all, Moroni's third visit, on September 21, 1825, the middle one of Moroni's five annual visits, came on the high point, the day on which that year Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, fell. Yom Kippur was the holiest of all days. On that day, people fasted, repented, and the high priest wore the name of Jehovah on his forehead and performed the once-a-year atonement and purification ordinances in the ancient Israelite temple. One can hardly imagine a more remarkable series of holy days for Moroni's profound visits. On those holy days, Moroni launched the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, whose teachings include these very themes, giving us more wonderful news about the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ, about repenting and making covenants with Christ, about God's plan of redemption and happiness, and about coming closer to God than does any other book. Keeping in frequent contact with Joseph throughout the duration of the translation of the Book of Mormon, Moroni saw the project through to completion in 1829. The book that he unveiled guides people to Christ's sweet fruit of the tree of life and to his great pleasing bar. For all of this, we thank you, Moroni. In addition to gathering scattered Israel, the Book of Mormon's title page also addresses every nation, culture, language, and people. And so we also would gladly welcome on Moroni's Day a multicultural, worldwide celebration of September 21st. That date also marks the world's semi-annual equinox, when the daytimes and nighttimes are both exactly 12 hours long. This reminds me of Lehi's axiom that there must needs be a counterbalancing opposition in all things, allowing all people to choose between light and dark, between joy and happiness, joy and misery, and eternal life on one hand and captivity of Satan on the other hand. For such reasons, in many religions around the world, the equinox is spiritually significant. That day, connected with the harvest season, teaches people that they will reap what they sow, both literally and figuratively. And in ancient Greek religion, the equinox was linked to Persephone's annual departure from our upper world of light back down into the underworld to become the wife of Hades, the god of the dead. Now on Moroni Day, Moroni reverses that unhappy tale. As he returned as a divine messenger from the dark world of the dead to bring his message of light to all those in the world of the living. So what are you thinking? Are we ready to start celebrating Moroni Day more seriously? In 2023, that day will be Moroni's 200th anniversary. When I mentioned the idea of Moroni Day to one church official here in Hawaii, he immediately said, Moroni Day should be proclaimed a worldwide holiday, and why not? While celebrating Moroni Day might include virtual tours of the Hill Cumora, artistic representations, and fabulously augmented reality programs, we would especially want to enshrine Moroni himself who he was, what he did, and what he taught in the three final books of the Book of Mormon itself. Knowing what Moroni knew, for he had seen our day and many of our doings, and also knowing whom he had seen, for he had seen the three Nephites as well as the Lord Jesus Christ. Moroni day is perfectly suited then to introduce everyone in the world to the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. So because Moroni was an expert record keeper, let's think. Moroni Day could also be a day for focusing on your own record keeping. Who among us wouldn't welcome encouragement and ideas about straightening up records of all kinds? Librarians, accountants, students, businesses, ward clerks, family historians, everyone 
at least once a year, should be sure their records are organized and in order. Records have power, especially the scriptures and church records. Only after priesthood ordinances are recorded do they become binding, both in heaven and also in earth, as Doctrine and Covenants 127, verse 7 states. And Moroni was very concerned about the effective performance of priesthood ordinances. In fact, he left us in his final chapters with the sacred words for ordaining priests, giving the gift of the Holy Ghost, blessing the sacrament, conducting congregational meetings, and baptizing only those over the age of accountability. Next, Moroni Day could well be a family day for bonding children and their fathers. Moroni dutifully continued to serve his father, Mormon, even after Mormon had died. As a young man, Moroni soon became his father's right-hand assistant. How do we know that? Well, when Moroni entered the Book of Ether into his father's record after the final Nephite battle, fulfilling the promise Mormon had made to his readers back in Mosiah 28, verse 19, that the Jaredite story would be later included, Moroni needed no instructions about how to abridge those 24 Jaredite plates, let alone how to make plates and inscribe them. He must have known all of that from working in his father's shop, although now he was working under adverse conditions and thus was understandably self-conscious about how difficult it was for him to place those characters and finish that job. This is where he encourages us to take our weaknesses to the Lord, and he will turn them into strengths. In addition, Moroni Day could also be a singles day. After all, Moroni spent 36 years alone, wandering widely to avoid being killed. It doesn't appear that he ever was married or remarried. He was left alone to write the sad tale of the destruction of his people. He even says he had no family, no kindred, no friends. And thus, he especially cherished the companionship he enjoyed with his resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Many are single today, like Moroni, for reasons largely beyond their control. But they can relate especially to the determination required of Moroni to carry forward, to complete the work that he had been given to do, and to feel the joy that he must have felt upon that work's completion. And next, realizing that all things that Moroni saw in visions September 21st could well be for us a reality check day. On that day, each of us can revisit the things Moroni saw that are happening in our world today. Moroni wanted to help us in facing such problems as people claiming that miracles are done away, saying that there is no life after death, and denying the powers of God. He warned of secret combinations and coalitions working behind closed doors, and that churches will become lifted up in envy and will twist the translation of the Holy Word of God. He said the Book of Mormon would come forth in a day of wildfires, smoke, earthquakes, tsunamis, wars, and rumors of wars. It will be, he said, a time of great pollutions, murders, robbing, frauds, deception, sexual violations, and many will say at that time, do whatever you want, it matters not. God upholds everyone. But more than being a theater of fear, Moroni would want his day also to be a day of solutions. His solutions come in the form of 22 imperatives, one commandment for each letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Coming at the end of Moroni's first farewell in Mormon chapter 9, Moroni's imperatives are, and give heed, despise not, wonder not, hearken unto the words of the Lord, 
Ask the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, whatever ye shall stand in need of, doubt not, be believing. Begin as in old times. Come unto the Lord with all your heart. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling before God. Be wise in the days of your probation. Strip yourselves of all uncleanness. Ask not to consume uncleanness upon your lusts. Ask with a firmness unshaken that ye will yield to no temptation. Serve the true and living God. See that you are not baptized unworthily. See that you partake not of the sacrament of Christ unworthily. See that you do all things in worthiness. Do all things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Endure to the end. Condemn me or others not because of mine or their imperfections. Condemn not my father Mormon or those who have written before him. Give thanks that God has made manifest our imperfections, that ye may be wiser than we have been. In addition, I would also think of Moroni Day as a day of exhortations. In Moroni 10, his very last chapter, Moroni passionately opens up his heart and expresses things about which he feels most strongly. Speaking by way of exhortation, he gave us four balanced couplets. Listen to these exhortations. First, I would exhort you to remember God's mercy to you from the creation down to today. And then, his most famous exhortation, I would exhort you to ask God in the name of Christ if these things are not true. His second pair, I would exhort you that ye deny not the power of God, and I exhort you that ye deny, deny, that ye deny not the gifts of God. His third pair, I would exhort you that ye remember that every good gift cometh of Christ, and I would exhort you to remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And his final pair, I would exhort you to remember these things, for ye shall see me at the bar of God. And thus, finally, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift and touch not the evil gift or any unclean thing. I assure you that Moroni's exhortations are valuable to you and all of us in Come Follow Me lessons in missionary work and personal growth and in teaching the gospel everywhere. In celebrating Moroni Day, let us take Moroni as our guide. In the end, Moroni Day would be a great day of invitation, a day of bearing testimony. And so today, I invite you to share with someone something about Moroni that impresses you and spurs you to righteousness, to action and happiness. Will you do that? Help your friends remember the many tender mercies that God has extended to them. And being in that grateful frame of mind and spirit, they can then be confident that God will be merciful still and will answer their prayers as they ask in the name of Jesus Christ for whatsoever thing they need. And with Moroni, you can then add your witness and bear your testimony to them that God will indeed manifest the truths of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost. So for Moroni Day, let's help Moroni in all these ways to sound his jubilant trumpet as he heralds the dawning of this brighter day. The book which Moroni brought is in a class by itself. It declares and delivers most clearly and beautifully to the world today the power and atoning love of Jesus Christ. May we all remember the truths exuberantly expressed by Parley P. Pratt in his great 
Moroni Day anthem. The morning breaks. The fullness of the gospel indeed now comes in with Israel's rays of truth at hand. Jehovah verily speaks, his mighty arm made bare, his covenant people to receive. Angels from heaven and truth from earth have truly met and borne record, and Zion's light is bursting forth. Majestic, it rises on the world, of which I humbly and gratefully bear my solemn witness to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.